With Lepidus having been deposed from his position of triumviral power, the entirety of the Roman world was split between Octavian and Antony. While Octavian, or rather, Octavian's brilliant general, Agrippa, was busy ousting Sextus Pompey from Sicily, Antony, in 37 BC, had returned to his provinces in the east. Antony had provided resources to Octavian's campaign against Sextus Pompey, but the result of Sextus's defeat was simply a strengthening of Octavian's power base in the west, with little benefit accruing to Antony. And so, when he returned to the east, Antony began to make overtures which hinted at a distancing from Octavian and a consolidation of his own eastern power. The most notable and symbolic act in this line involved his romantic involvement with Cleopatra. While Antony had previously met Cleopatra in the city of Cilicia, in Asia Minor, their relations had initially been conducted on a strictly professional basis. Yet, at some point in the intervening years, Antony and Cleopatra had begun a love affair, and when Antony returned to the east from his meeting with Octavian in Tarentum, he made an open profession of his amatory association with Cleopatra in the Syrian city of Antioch. While Roman men commonly cavorted with mistresses outside of their marriages, one must remember that Antony was at this time married to Octavian's sister, Octavia. Though his association with Cleopatra had no legal significance, his choice of a foreign queen as his mistress was, in its way, a public repudiation of Octavian. Politically, his alliance to Cleopatra was rather astute. Egypt was the last remaining center of Mediterranean power and civilization which had not been formally annexed to the Roman Empire. By becoming Cleopatra's lover, Antony made himself the de facto king of Egypt. Cleopatra, too, benefited from this alliance with Antony. Dynastic struggles had resulted in a civil war between Cleopatra and her brother-slash-husband, Ptolemy XIII, which was put to an end with Caesar's intervention and Ptolemy's death. Nevertheless, years later, civil discord still threatened Cleopatra's position. But by allying herself with Antony, she was able to solidify her own grip on power by making it clear to any potential enemies within Egypt that they would face Roman retribution if they attempted a coup. At the time, the population of Egypt was markedly multicultural, with a Greek ruling class and a native element of Egyptians. In order to bolster their image, Antony and Cleopatra began to market themselves to the Greeks as Dionysus and Aphrodite, and to the Egyptians as their Egyptian equivalents, Osiris and Isis. Antony and Cleopatra had a pair of twins who were named Alexander Helios, the sun, and Cleopatra Selene, the moon. The name of Alexander had a potent appeal in Egypt, which had been ruled by the Ptolemies, successors to Alexander's general Ptolemy I, since Alexander's death in 323 BC. Cleopatra was the most recent of Ptolemaic bloodline, but the use of the name Alexander was meant to hint at Antony and Cleopatra's claim to rule all of Alexander's former empire, which included not only Egypt and Rome's eastern provinces, but also much of the empire of the Parthians. And so it was with the aim of finally embarking upon his long-prepared Parthian campaign that Antony conducted much of his statecraft and political theater in this period. The Parthians loomed large in the Roman imagination as they constituted the only real empire impinging upon Roman dominion in the first century. It was with the aim of annexing Parthian territory that Marcus Crassus, one of the members of the first triumvirate along with Caesar and Pompey, had embarked upon a disastrous military expedition in the east. In 53 BC, Crassus, in command of seven legions, encountered the Parthians in the Battle of Carai. While the Romans did employ some auxiliary cavalry, the legion was primarily an infantry force. By contrast, the Parthians were mounted archers, who employed the tactic of riding toward the enemy, rapidly wheeling around, and then, having turned themselves around on their saddles, shooting backward at the enemy as they retreated. Thus, even though Crassus' troops outnumbered the Parthians, the Roman legions were devastated by the Parthian cavalry charge. Crassus and some of the legionaries managed to escape. When Crassus attempted to parley with the Parthian general Serena, he was killed. Following the destruction of the legions, several of the Aquilae, golden eagles which served as legionary standards, were taken by the Parthians. These eagles possessed such great symbolic significance in the Roman mind that in many ways their capture vexed the Romans even more than the loss of the soldiers themselves, and the Parthian possession of the standards of the Roman legion was a lasting insult to Roman pride. According to Crassus's biographer, Plutarch, Crassus's head was brought back to the Parthian king's court, where it was used as a stage prop in a royal production of Euripides' play, The Bacchae, which features a scene in which the character of Agave draws forth the severed head of the Theban king Pentheus. 
It was with all of this in mind that Antony had set himself for so long on the project of avenging Rome's defeat by assaulting the Parthians. Cleopatra attempted to dissuade Antony from this crusade against Parthia, but nevertheless he set out on the expedition in 36. In this effort, he was relying upon the support of various client kings in the east, among whom was Artavasdes II, the king of Armenia. The most direct line of assault against the Parthians involved direct passage across the Euphrates, but this was deemed too difficult given the level of Parthian fortification. And so, Antony led his troops through nor north through Armenia, but Artavasdes failed to support Antony when the Parthians assaulted a Roman supply line. Eventually, Antony was forced to retreat, but even during his attempted withdrawal from Armenia and Syria, continued Parthian harassment of his legions led to further losses. Sensing an opportunity, Sextus Pompey, who had fled east following his defeat at the hands of Agrippa in 36, attempted to take advantage of Antony's apparent weakness and attack the Roman provinces in Asia Minor. In 35 BC, Sextus was finally defeated, captured, and killed. Following his own defeat, uh, Antony's wife, Octavia, attempted to cross to the east in the spring of 35, bringing with her a fresh store of supplies and troops. When she stopped in Athens, which served as a halfway point between Rome and the eastern provinces, she received a letter from Antony dismissing her back to Rome. The letter, of course, told her to send the supplies and troops to the east. This was a shocking affront to a faithful wife and served to agitate traditional Roman sentiment against Antony. He had, after all, dismissed his lawful Roman wife from his presence while continuing an affair with an eastern queen. Antony used these reinforcements to invade Armenia and capture Artavasdes II. He then withdrew to the Greek city of Ephesus, located along the Ionian coast of Asia Minor in what is now Turkey. From 33 to 32, he wintered there with Cleopatra and arranged the political affairs of the eastern provinces to his liking. After arranging these eastern affairs, Antony returned with Cleopatra to the Egyptian capital of Alexandria, where he celebrated a triumph. In the absence of any Parthian conquests, Artavasdes was paraded and ritually humiliated in the parade. Then the city was summoned as a witness to one of the most scandalous acts in recent Roman memory, known afterward as the Donations of Alexandria. Antony issued a proclamation which ceded various territories to Cleopatra and made her the ruler of Rome's client kingdoms in the east. Octavian and Antony had never been friends. Their alliance was largely dictated by political necessity. When they first enlisted themselves in the second triumvirate with Lepidus, there were several other prominent power players in Rome. A hostile senate led by Cicero, the Tyrannicides and their eastern armies led by Brutus and Cassius, the armies of Lepidus, which the triumvirs managed to co-opt by including Lepidus in the triumvirate, and the forces of Sextus Pompey. But with the exception of the disgraced Lepidus, all of these people had been killed either in battle or the prescriptions, and it was clear by this point in 32 that the rupture between Octavian and Antony was irreparable. In the summer of 32, Antony sent a message to Rome announcing that he was divorcing Octavia. For many Romans, this was a step too far. One of these was a man named Lucius Munatius Plancus, who could sense that the wind was blowing in Octavian's favor. In order to ingratiate himself with the future ruler, he informed Octavian that Antony had deposited his will with the Vestal Virgins. Though it was illegal to do so, Octavian had this will removed from safekeeping and read before the Senate, which was scandalized and outraged by its contents. In the will, Antony declared that Cleopatra's son Caesarion was the son of Julius Caesar and his true heir. This, of course, would delegitimize Octavian, whose entire career was predicated upon being the heir of Caesar. Moreover, the will stated that his children with Cleopatra would inherit Rome's eastern provinces as their own, and declared Antony's intention to be buried next to Cleopatra in Alexandria. Up until this point, it would have been a difficult task to convince the Senate to wage war against Antony. The Romans had suffered countless civil wars in the first century and had no stomach for another. But Antony's will served as a propaganda coup for Octavian. His war would not be a civil war against Antony, but a war against a foreign queen who had corrupted a once noble Roman and used him as a puppet to strengthen her own position. Every Roman feared that the glories of the Eternal City would yield to the influence of Cleopatra as the Roman Empire shifted its power base to Alexandria and became the Egyptian Empire. While this propagandistic iron was hot, Octavian struck and declared war on Cleopatra. All of the citizens of Italy and the western provinces were required to sign a personal oath of loyalty to Octavian. This war hinged in large part on one battle fought at Actium in September of 31 BC. 
Octavian's general, Agrippa, had managed to blockade Antony and Cleopatra's forces and create a famine among his camp. After their fleet was drawn up, Cleopatra's ship bolted through the harbor, and Antony's followed close behind. In the confusion, the bulk of their fighting fleet initially engaged with Agrippa, but once they noticed that their leaders had fled, they all surrendered to Octavian. Antony and Cleopatra retreated to Alexandria, where Octavian moved against them in 30 BC. The city quickly surrendered, and Antony killed himself. Octavian had Caesarion, that is, Caesar's son with Cleopatra, murdered, and took Cleopatra into captivity. Cleopatra did not wish to be richly humiliated by being led in a triumph by Octavian, and so she had an asp snuck into her cell. The snake bit her, and she died as its venom coursed through her veins. Cleopatra's death marked the end of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which had lasted nearly 300 years, and Egypt was finally annexed to the Roman Empire. The Battle of Actium is often regarded as the terminus or end point of the Roman Republic. In many ways, republican institutions had so broken down by the middle of the first century that few Romans from earlier ages would have recognized a political system so beset by powerful individuals and civil wars as republican at all. Nevertheless, the political logic of the Roman system reached its culmination as Octavian survived and stood victorious among the graves of nearly a century's worth of noble men. The oaths of loyalty which the western provinces had sworn to him made Octavian the patron of all Romans, and there was no longer a single individual powerful or influential enough to oppose him. Octavian was now cloaked in an immense power which would have put the early Roman kings to shame, a power entirely unprecedented in Roman history. It would be the project of the next 45 years of his life to pretend not to have it.